And we're live. Just gonna give people a few minutes to join us here. Good evening, I'm Susan Kreischer, Associate Director of Alumni Relations. Welcome to Why Elections Matter, Impacts on Local, State, and National Policies with Stephanie DeMarco and Grace Dunnigan, moderated by Dr. Nick Clark. The discussion will highlight the reasons why elections matter, explain how outcomes affect policy agendas at local, state, and national levels, and discuss the pros and cons of our nation's current two-party system. Additionally, they will share ways in which students and alumni can become involved in politics. Dr. Clark will kick us off in just a minute, but first I wanna let you know that this session is being recorded. And I wanna welcome several Susquehanna faculty and staff who are joining us tonight, including Dr. Um, Melissa Kimura, Vice President of Advancement, and also joining us from the Advancement team are Michelle Sears and Chris Markle. If you have questions tonight, please use the Q&A. We'll do our best to answer them at the end of the session. Tonight's moderator is Dr. Nick Clark, Professor and Department Head of Political Science, Director of Public Policy, and Director of the Innovation Center. His classes focus on democracy, poverty, inequity, economics, the European Union, comparative government, politics, and public policy. He earned a PhD in political science from Indiana University, master's degrees in Germany and the Netherlands, and a bachelor's degree from Hastings College. Prior to joining Susquehanna in 2003, he was a guest lecturer at University of Oklahoma and Indiana University. Dr. Clark, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Stephanie DeMarco graduated from Susquehanna in 2015 with a degree in political science, a minor in music technology, and she was a member of Kappa Delta Sorority. She earned a master's in public administration from Villanova University and is currently a data specialist for Forrester, a research and advisory firm. Previously, she served as a legislative assistant for members of the U.S. House of Representatives. Grace Dunnigan graduated from Susquehanna in 2019 with degrees in political science and religious studies and was a member of the Student Government Association, the Pre-Law Society, and Alpha Delta Pi sorority. She's an experienced staffer in Pennsylvania's capital region and an active community advocate. Uh, she's joining us tonight as a proud alum to share some insights rather than in a, in a professional capacity. And I'll just say that the department is very proud of both of these graduates and the successes that they've had since they uh, left. Uh, and so we're going to start with some questions I developed ahead of time for the two panelists, and then we will um, move on to some questions we've received from alums and then open it up for a broader Q&A. So I'll just start uh, with my first question, which is, in your experience, how do elections matter, if at all, for how the government actually functions? Uh, and I think maybe um, we'll start with Grace on this one and then Steph and then alternate as we move through the other questions. That sounds great. Uh, thanks, Dr. Clark, and thank you for that introduction. Um, this, the answer that I have to this question is very much a state government staffer question, so apologies in advance, uh, but I think that it, it absolutely matters, right? Um, having people who are in office and want to make government function determine what level the government is going to function. Um, so this is at not just the executive level, but also legislative level. The executive branch oversees the agencies, which are the most public facing government entities. So think your Medicaid, your unemployment, your social security, that kind of stuff. Um, customer service driven models often come at the guidance of the executive office. So to have that positive interaction with government is often coming from the executive level. It's not something the agencies often take on at their own account. Um, and the legislative branch determines what funding each agency receives. So when programs are underfunded, um, it makes government operate less efficiently. So if they're mostly underfunded for like political reasons, like you want to cut government spending or, you know, it's not politically savvy for you to support welfare programs or like the unemployment system. So then you run into this kind of negative loop where public officials prefer to obstruct government services capitalize off of that rage and then instead 
they could allocate appropriate funding, staffing, and time to fixing the issues, but they don't want to do that. Um, so something that we hear a lot, like for example, is we need to disband the Department of State because the Bureau of Professional Licensing takes too long. That's not a viable solution to the problem. A better solution to the problem is that the Bureau of Profes Professional Licensing is understaffed and underfunded, and instead we should take the time and devote the resources needed to fix that problem. So yes, it matters. That's a very administrative answer, but honestly, that's how it's going to affect your government and the way that you interact with it. Thanks. Uh, Steph? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to echo what Grace said here. It absolutely does matter. You see the implications of this across the board. Grace touched on it. Across, you have obviously your executive side of things is going to be administering. Um, your legislative side is controlling the purse strings. They're also providing some oversight there. So if something's not functioning well, the people that you're electing are in charge of making sure um, that we're investigating why or why not something's working, providing that oversight if needed. The executive branch is also providing what sort of investment and in making those decisions of how they wanna run a program. Um, even so far as like we're seeing changes in like the CX investment of how we as constituents interact with our own government, right? How can we make that better? Historically, particularly the federal government has been ranked miserably on this for years. I'm sure everybody here has had a frustrating experience with the IRS or even trying to get your passport renewed, right? So the investment of how we even interact on that level um, as well. So I definitely think that elections matter. Uh, the next question, and this is similar to the first, but a little different, it's focused more on policy. Do you think of elections affect policy outcomes? And if so, how? And I think with that, we'll start with Steph. Yeah, once again, um, they absolutely uh, affect policy outcomes. Who you're electing is making those decisions for the direction of the policy, right? Um, across all three branches, they're setting the priorities, objectives, from the creation to how it's being implemented to the oversight of these programs. Um, you can see the implications of this. Attorney General may not decide to file an amicus brief um, on a topic or, you know, uh, Congress is handling the purse strings. You know, they may, there may be a program, but they're not gonna fund it, right? Um, if that's not in line with what they're campaigning on, that's not in line with their platform. Um, your governor may decide to slow walk the impl implementation of a program, right? Or move staff around to ensure certain outcomes of that. So you really do see elections impacting the outcomes because those are the folks driving the policy. Yeah, Steph nailed it. Um, pretty much that is, that is correct. I think the other um, facet of this, right, is that elections also determine who the party leaders are going to be within the political parties. So whoever you know the president is leads that political party, um, but not just your presidents, right? It can be the governors, it can be high ranking uh, house leadership. So like the speaker, pro temp of the Senate, that kind of stuff. They are also driving the policy. And subsequently, party leaders can also be people with large social media followings. So think like your AOCs, your Ron DeSantis of the world. They're helping to drive that party platform because one, they're elected officials and their message gets boosted on Twitter, but also they're influencing it just as much as the Speaker of the House is. So it's it's twofold. They're going to determine what gets on the calendar, what gets voted on, what executive orders get written, but also internally they drive the party's policy too. And if I can jump back in quickly and just piggyback off of you, Grace, I think in, in my personal experience, particularly your, your local elected leader, I'm thinking of like your member of Congress, those folks are representing your district and your district alone or your state and your state alone. What matters to you and your district, they're fighting for that legislatively. So if there's something like an industry or a, a program or funding that's needed for a specific bridge perhaps, or whatever it may be, a river, uh, some lakefront shore that needs dredging, right? Your member, is creating policy or programs to get that done for something specifically in your district um, or your state for that matter. So I think 
when we talk about who we elect and why it matters, having that political clout and somebody who knows what's important to your area and is gonna fight for that is so important. And you can see that direct impact here at home. Um, so that's really why it is important. And I think about that in a lot of sense of, on the federal level too, I can think of numerous examples of maybe why one, just one particular member of Congress is a reason that one program is there and it's still getting funded because they're in there every single year, every single appropriation cycle fighting for that. Um, so that's important. If you maybe didn't elect someone who felt strongly and just didn't maybe show up that go around for that, there your funding goes. So who you elect really does matter. So for next, I should preface the next question by saying if it's not clear yet, our two panelists it's we we have both a bipartisan panel and we have a panel covering experience in both state and national government. Uh, but the next question is, as leaders uh, in your two parties, do you think the party system is helping or hurting American politics? Um, this is, uh, I, I read this and I was like, this is a classic Dr. Clark loaded question uh, that you would see on a written exam. Um, so I hope that this answer that does that justice. Um, I'm also going to walk a middle track with this, but as it currently stands, I think that the party system is hurting American politics. Uh, the duality of the system, basically the two sides, force both sides of the aisle to kind of diverge and it is the perfect environment for extremes to fall into the mainstream. That's because there's no third party, there's really truly no viable way for a third party to participate in the political system, like just point blank, third parties do not win elections. Um, and because there's no viable avenue, they tend to kind of worm their way into the mainstreams of the political platform. Um, it also leads politicians to fight for a very small section of the population. Uh, most voters are going to choose the D or the R next to the name, almost regardless of who it is. Um, I think this is changing though. Uh, I think we're seeing kind of a rise in personality politics where people are voting more for the person rather than the party platform or that D or that R. Good examples there are John Fetterman for US Senate in Pennsylvania. People vote for him because he looks like them, he sounds like them and he feels like them, not necessarily because he's running as a Democrat. Um, the other kind of part of this that you can't leave out in my opinion is uh, gerrymandering. Uh, the Supreme Court's continued negligence to take up any sort of gerrymandering case, gerrymandering is diluting millions of votes in all states. Um, and this leads to like a what's the point of voting mentality if my vote doesn't even count. Um, I think there are changes we can't make that would make this a viable system. Uh, I, I am a burn it down kind of person. I would start from scratch if we could, but that's not the way to make change and small changes within the system we have is way more viable than overthrowing the entire thing. So I think two things that we could take to make this political system that we operate within work better include uh, ranked choice voting. Alaska has implemented that. We've seen it work out for them in elections. Um, there's some serious voter education efforts that need to undergo to make that a more viable option. But I think uh, implementing small changes like that, and then also political gerrymandering needs to go in favor of, you know, either like a third party or independent redistricting commission, um, federal sign off, however you want it to be structured, just get it out of the hands of the people that are trying to win those seats from drawing the maps. Uh, so those are, that's my middle ground there. Uh, Steph, punt to you. I'm also going to follow suit and go middle of the road that it's a mixed bag for me, right? I think the party system does have, like the two-party system does have some positives, right? It's going to help move forward certain policy agenda items. It does provide a strong support system for candidates and infrastructure for those folks working within there. Um, and it's also a really great way that you're bringing, you know, folks together who share similar ideals. And I think that they've done a wonderful job in doing that. But on the other side of that coin, um, I think it has created a lot of division and, and Grace touched on this too. Not everybody's gonna fit <laughs> nicely into these two buckets, right? And doesn't leave you room to really operate outside of that. And then you have a lot of in-party fighting that has really been to the detriment of the party's own platform on both sides of the coin, whether it be 
Tea Party, the MAGA folks on the right, or maybe your democratic socialist, socialist folks on the left, it, it happens on both sides that will steamroll your own party's platform or issues that's happening. So I, where do those folks go, right? Um, and we sort of, you touched on some options there, Grace, about maybe how can we fix that, you know, expanding. But I also think that's part of the party's job as well um, and each of our own respective um, parties to create space for them. How do we work together? How do we handle those different viewpoints, right? So I think that that's also, if we can't create a function in America, and I don't know that it's possible at this point, that's a larger discussion, um, if we're ever gonna be able to move away from the two-party system, but how can our parties do a better job of creating space um, for differing views for those folks who don't necessarily just tick all of those boxes, right? How can we make it more acceptable if you wanna reach across the aisle? And you know, you're a moderate, you wanna create compromise. How do we make space for that, right? We see less and less of that. How can we encourage that? Um, how do we make space if you wanna you know, dissent and you're on the fringe, there's still space for you, but how do we create that dialogue amongst our own parties and then across party as well? So I think, you know, it obviously has created huge partisanship. We've seen the rise of that. Um, identity politics has really taken over. And so I think by, I don't know what the solution may be in creating that additional space within our own parties, but I would hope that that would help um, deal with some of the boiling point situation that we've sort of caused from this two party system in, in recent times where it's really just sort of hit that boiling point. You know, it used to be a common recurring media story to feature examples of bipartisanship uh, members of the two parties that would come together and form close friendships over time, despite mm -hmm. partisan differences. I'm curious if either of you have seen examples of that, even at the sort of aid level um, in the state of Pennsylvania or in DC. You said on the aid level, like staffer relationships? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, relationships, yeah, friendships between staffers that cross partisan boundaries, as well as the people that you work for. Oh, all the time. Uh, all the time. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> um, one time I saw Mike Terzai and John Fetterman dance together. So for those of you who don't know what Pennsylvania politics means, okay, it, 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 that's the lieutenant governor and then the Speaker of the House, and they were at each other's throats for a while. So um, it's possible. Um, but it, it, you run into issues sometimes with certain people that work for certain uh, members of the other side that are just so in it and their their entire personality is their job and everything their boss believes in and you kind of can't get them out of that uh, little bubble. But yeah, I mean, I have friends that have worked for the House and the Senate and all, all the time. And I echo that. I think you see it really on a staffer level and I think on the federal sense in a state's delegation, you see that a lot, right? You'll see a lot of pairing to get something that's important to your state whether it be the Pennsylvania delegation, I have experience in the Michigan delegation, those folks have to work together to get what they need as a state. Um, so you're constantly creating those relations with the staffers, especially in your own delegation, and then also by issue area topic. But you really do see that a lot with members. It's not, you know, it's not a media story quite as frequently, but you do see still like the congressional baseball games and things like that, like the competitions, like they're creating their own beers and like all these really cool events that are created to help bring different members together across the aisle, like working towards doing something fun to create those relationships. They're still happening. Um, they're just like you said, Dr. Clark, that you're not always seeing it on the media anymore, but they're still there. So I want to move on and talk a little bit about the upcoming election and ask you each what you think is at stake in this upcoming election. I mean, really at either level, you, I think you both can talk both about Pennsylvania politics and national politics, but uh, maybe we'll start with Grace for this one. Yeah, so um, state, I'll talk about the state level, staff, I'll give you the, the federal level, um, and I think you can talk about it a little better than I can, but at the state level, I think probably one of the most salient issues uh, and probably one of the biggest issues that we're seeing right now is bodily autonomy, right? 
uh, with the decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Org, the right to an abortion is no longer federally protected. So it is up to the states. And uh, as we saw in Kansas, states care deeply about it. Um, since Dobbs, we've seen a swath of states rush to restrict the right. We've also seen a swath of states move to protect it. Um, for people who get pregnant, this is obviously a very detrimental issue. Um, but there, it's more than that. It, it's also a criminalization of care issue in the medical community. Uh, doctors are at risk of being prosecuted often for murder, uh, for performing routine medical procedures that have absolutely no relation to an abortion, but use a similar technique uh, because the people writing these laws are not as informed about the human body as they probably should be. Uh, governors are the last line of defense on this stuff. Um, in Pennsylvania, we have a Republican General Assembly, have had a Republican General Assembly for a very long time. Um, last eight years, Governor Wolf was the Democratic governor. He vetoed every uh, anti-abortion uh, restricting the right to choose bill that came to his desk. Also put an executive order out to help um, expand the right to choose in Pennsylvania. So they, governors are really, really important. And we're going to see that a lot um, in Pennsylvania. And then the other thing that is kind of along the line at the state level is um, elections and democracy in general. So there are more big lie candidates. I don't like that term, but it's the only one that I know uh, to kind of encompass them um, on the ballot than ever before. And that's also because this is the first election since it's happened, right? Um, but the, they're, the very fabric of our electoral system is at risk here. Um, and this is more important at the state level than the federal level because at the state level, the Secretary of State certifies the election. In Pennsylvania, that's appointed by the governor. In some states like Arizona, it's a separate elected position. Um, so it, it really matters here because the, if the Secretary of State and the governor don't like the results of the election, they can choose not to certify it. Um, it also matters for your state legislature. So there is this fun little thing called an independent state legislature theory that we're seeing um, being entertained, uh, particularly by uh, the Supreme Court has just agreed to take a case to hear the merits of this. Um, but basically it involves a, a state legislator voting to overrule whatever the vote was um, by the general population, send their own slate of electors, and potentially, with a couple key swing states doing this, change the results of the election due to the electoral college. So those are the two big state-related issues. Um, and obviously, there's 100 million more. Um, but these are probably just the two loudest ones that you're going to hear. And then, staff, I punt to you for federal perspective. These are also federal issues, so. Yeah, they are. Uh, <laughs> we all work together, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I always, at the risk of sounding a little dramatic here, um, what's at stake this upcoming election? Obviously, simple facts, you know, control of the House and Senate, both of those chambers, right? That's, that's the number one. Right now, we think that the House is going to pick up some Republican seats, maybe not in as large a majority as we originally thought, but the House is, you know, now sort of, I mean, the Senate's now sort of leaning Dem and keeping that. So control over our legislature essentially is what we're voting on in this election. And that's also the direction um, of policy in our country, right? That those platforms, um, we talk about the issues that are really going to matter and that's going to be on the platform. You know, it's our economy, it's inflation, it's how are we recovering from this pandemic and getting folks back to work? It's how we're making those decisions moving forward, how we're going to spend that money. We also have an emergence, particularly on a national level, it's going to be of huge importance. How are we going to deal with Ukraine, the emerging Russia situation, and the energy crisis that's following suit with that, right? So those folks who are making those decisions, I mean, who's in charge of that? What direction of that that's going to go? obviously is going to be of a huge importance as you know stakes are getting higher especially on the global side of things and America's role in that what is our aid to Ukraine look like how are we going to deal with Putin um, what's going to happen if China decides to sort of step in there with Taiwan and that escalates right so we're sort of hitting a lot of emerging fields right now as our economy is still struggling to recover from this global pandemic right so when like I said, at the risk of sounding dramatic, you know, that's the policy outcome that you're going to be voting on um, in the legislature this, this election cycle. So it's, it's very important. 
The other interesting thing, um, and this is very niche, Pennsylvania specific, but that's what I do for work. So sorry, that's what I can talk about. Um, but Pennsylvania is in a really unique situation here, right? We have a vacant governor's seat and a vacant Senate seat. So we have no incumbent bias for those two big ones. Um, it'll be really interesting to see how in the less than a month left, um, these candidates pull it out. Uh, on, on the governor side, you got Josh Shapiro. He's the current uh, Democratic nominee, current attorney general of Pennsylvania, um, going up against Doug Mastriano, who's running as the Republican nominee. Um, he's current state senator. So both of them Pennsylvania oriented. Um, and then Senate, you have John Fetterman running as a Democratic nominee, current lieutenant governor. And then um, Dr. Oz, the who's running as a Republican nominee, uh, TV personality guy. So seeing, um, how those all, all four of them are vastly different campaigns, seeing which are going to appeal to Pennsylvania voters when there's no incumbent uh, to kind of hold them back is going to be really interesting from a campaign perspective. Yeah, the Senate race is starting to narrow a little but I still mm -hmm. think, you know, on the, re especially this year on the Republican side, because those two candidates are appealing to very different constituencies within the Republican Party. There really needs to be close coordination between them, which you would normally see, but we're not seeing that here. And I, I'm still, I, I, it's going to hurt both those campaigns in the end. But It's really interesting. And I would argue you don't see it a whole lot on the Democratic side either. Josh and John are doing too much stuff together. They've gotten a little bit better, but in the beginning, they were way far apart. So they're all, all four of them are running completely different styles. And it's going to be, really interesting to see which one is the most effective. I mean, it used to be that each of the two parties would have a coordinated campaign effort state by yeah. state. I assume that's still happening, right? Or is, is there a coordinated campaign? And do, do, do either of you know? I mean, between like, like, a, like a platform, like specifically the, Democratic Party platform or like? Well, usually the each of the two state parties with national backing would hire somebody to run a campaign that was designed to just promote the party in general and to try and draw linkages across the various candidates. Um, yeah, usually I, I can only speak to like the PA GOP, but usually that would be their job to sort of facilitate that. Um, and I think that that's sort of indicative of the fact that you have, and that you also have to get the okay from those two candidates, right? So I think that, I think there's some something at play there that they're two di very different candidates. Maybe they don't feel comfortable sort of lumping themselves together or um, there's maybe some internal issues on both of those, how that's functioning differently as leadership changes in those, you know, PA, GOP, or, you know, on the opposite side of things and dealing with this, like, uh, like, I will just say that it's usually those folks who will coordinate that effort. And I don't know necessarily that that's, happening as effectively as it has in the past but i do think it is it is that historically the operation of like the pa gop who would be doing that so yeah they're still around um pa dems works more on the legislature i think at this point that's really where their focus is um i also am biased in any conversation about the pa dems because we don't always get along um but <laughs> they i they, they exist. I just think that you have a lot of these candidates, these four specifically, have really big personalities, and they're not going to be told what to do by a party platform. That goes for both sides of the aisle on these guys. Um, so probably the one that's most likely to listen is like Josh, um, just because he's more in the, he comes from more of that like classic politician you know he was in the state house then he was a commissioner then he was the attorney general he kind of runs the route a little bit more than the other three do um but i i don't i think it just is coming down to the way they're running their campaigns stephanie cool i'm nodding because i agree yeah I think this is just honestly a product of who these individual candidates are and not so much as historically some of their interactions previously with their own party establishment and you sort of see that in, in regards to who they're taking in, what they're meeting with, who they're seeking advice from, um, isn't always a traditional establishment folks that you're seeing. I think maybe like Oz on our side is more keen to sort of step into that 
versus Mastriano. He's more like, <laughs> you know, doing his own things and some of the, the fringe aspects of that. But I do think that that their individual personalities is what's really causing that more so than anything else. So I agree with you, Grace. I also think it's that like personality politics thing, right? They want to separate themselves from being a typical politician because as we've seen, that is a, it's a viable campaign strategy. So I think they're also being intentional maybe about distancing themselves from the parties. Is there a sense in Harrisburg and in DC of who's going to maybe win each of these two races? I mean, I, I, I know what the media coverage and the polling is saying, but I'm curious if there's conventional wisdom you guys are coming across there. Uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit to this. Um, if you had asked me this like two weeks ago, I would have had such a good answer for you. Um, but a lot has changed in the last two or three weeks in Pennsylvania politics. Uh, the, the polls have gone flip-flop. Um, Especially the, for the Senate race, right? I mean, especially with the Senate race. Um, yeah. If you look at 538, which grain of salt for 538, obviously, they have Josh winning 96 out of 100 models up against Doug. The problem here is that I think the measurements that 538 uses, such as spending, fundraising, engagement, ad revenue, like taking out ads, that is giving Josh a disproportionate bump because Doug is doing none of that stuff. Um, he is operating this campaign almost entirely through like the internet. And it's, it's really interesting to see how he's doing it. Um, it's almost this like underground network that is bumping him, bumped him to be the, the nominee in a really crowd, crowded primary. So I'm not as confident um, but the the general consensus, at least in Harrisburg, is that Josh is going to pull it out. I am knocking on wood after saying that. Um, but the other thing is, Pennsylvania, Josh has every card stacked against him. Traditionally, the governor's office flips every single time. So I think it's been since Thornburg or one of those other really dated ones where you have a Republican come in for eight years, a Democrat come in for eight years, Republican come in for eight years, Democrat come in for eight years. So coming off of eight years of Tom Wolf, who um, regardless of what you say uh, in terms of his legacy was the COVID governor. He did a lot of things at a really politically hot time um, that people don't always love. The cards for Josh are not in his favor, however, he was the sole nominee uh, in the primary. So that says something um, that nobody really wanted to challenge him. He, the party put him up as their best shot. And I, I think that he still is. So, you know, if the polls are to be believed, it, it's Josh, but if history is to be believed, it's not necessarily Josh. Well, and he has a and national, he has a <laughs> national political environment working against him as well. But mm -hmm. Steph, what about you? What's, What's the consensus in DC that you're hearing? Yeah, I, I will just echo first on the governor race and say, I think folks in DC have just sort of cast that aside that like Doug's not pulling that out and that's not even a talking point to us anymore. That's, he's lost it and we've moved on. Um, obviously the Senate race is a little bit different. I think the rhetoric on that in DC is, is more so of the fact that you know, Oz is really getting his footing. I think earlier on, um, you know, he had spent so much time and money and sort of overcoming his primary, right? Um, and all that negative press that was sort of aimed at each other and sort of how do we rebound from that, right? After, you know, spending so much money, rebounding fundraising wise, um, fighting claims from, you know, your own party coming out of such a hot prime primary situation. So now that I think that we've moved past that, um, you know, I think the latest poll that I saw is that like we were six points from each other <laughs> in there. So, um, obviously I think there's a chance. I think folks are thinking that there's, there's still room to maneuver, um, for Oz and that he may be able to pull this one out, depending on what happens. I think it's really going to come down to your white college educated suburban mom voters that's in, in purple districts that's where Fetterman's still really leading, where Oz isn't. So I think that that's really gonna come into play here and what voter turnout's gonna look like um, in those areas. And I think, you know, 
to a certain aspect, a lot of the rhetoric is, you know, how much is this abortion issue going to play into those particular voters where he does have such a lead over Oz and sort of how do we get in there and, and message in, in that regard. So I do think <laughs> there is some room to maneuver there. I do not think it's a done deal. And I'm very interested to see how this, how the campaigns maneuver for sure. Um, so I'm going to change direction a little bit and just ask you the last prepared question we have, which is, what are way, the ways in which you would each encourage students and recent alumni to get involved in politics or government? Uh, maybe Steph, we'll start with you on this one. Sure. So I think first and foremost, I always start this conversation by please vote. <laughs> That's, you know, obviously number one. Um, to getting your voice being heard. And secondly, you know, if you want to get involved in politics in your government, the best way is interacting with your elected officials on a local, state, and federal level. It can be as simple as attending an event that they have. If you have a question, they will help you with casework in a lot of regards. Reach out to them. Use them as a touch point. Get to know the staffers there. Get to know the members there. I don't think a lot of people realize how accessible their members can be, obviously, you know, your center is going to be a little bit harder to nail, your, you know, federal center is going to be a little bit harder to nail down than maybe your, your U.S. congressman or your state senator. But either way, you can request a meeting. You can have that touch point with them. Get to know your elected officials. Obviously, you can volunteer with, you know, your party. You can engage on election side of things, advocacy groups. Obviously you can volunteer and engage in those areas as well. I always support that and recommend that. But honestly, I think the best way is to sort of get to know your elected officials. They're much more accessible than I think people realize, so. Thank you. Yeah, my, my first one is vote too. Uh, make sure you have a plan to vote, know how you're voting or registered to vote. If you have questions, Department of State's website or your county election office, not on election day, just do it before election day. Make sure you're ready to go on November 8th. Um, but this is my favorite question because I get to talk about local politics, which is very close to my heart. Um, I, I worked for Governor Wolf for three years. And when I was there uh, for about a year and a half of that, I did local some of our local government work. Um, so I, I care deeply about it. And I think that it's something that everybody should care deeply about. So if you want to get involved in politics or government, local level is where it is at. Um, I have this in all capital letters in my notes. Local government cannot emphasize how important this is. The smaller the government office, the closest you interact with it on a daily basis, right? Like the president has nothing to do with your trash pickup. That is at the local level. So think your mayors, your city councils, township supervisors, county commissioners, school boards. Um, these are the elected officials that have a say in your day-to-day -day life, how you interact with your community. Um, and then this is my soapbox and ax to grind, and I will do it separately. I won't subject you all to this. Um, but local government is an underpaid, underappreciated, and thankless job. People are more critical of them than that it could be believed. Mayors are not in it for the money. You can look up how much your local officials are. And I guarantee you, if you look it up online, you will be kind of shocked uh, at the amount. Um, the other thing is local government is particularly important in Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania is a commonwealth. And we are one of four in the country. And commonwealths have uh, means that basically like these local governments, these municipalities have a disproportionate not necessarily disproportionate, but just a higher amount of power and autonomy compared to states. So the races here are more important. Like county commissioners and county election officials run the elections. That's a huge responsibility. Um, and COVID only exacerbated how important local government is, right? Like school boards voting on remote curriculums, uh, mask mandates in public parks, uh, COVID guidelines in city hall. Uh, vaccine distribution and as simple as like advocating for your community. If you had good county commissioners that knew how to advocate for you, your vaccine allocation could look better. Not necessarily, it was based on a number of factors, but you know what I mean? It, it helped to have somebody in your, in your corner. And that happens at the local level. Um, and I will say that Democrats are terrible at caring about local races. 
um, Republicans have it down. And that is why they hold the majority of local offices, because they've cared about this a lot longer than Democrats have. Um, they've gotten better about it since uh, the pandemic, but you know, it, it, it's not been our forte recently. Um, so if you aren't able to run for a local office, uh, help them out, basically. Um, door knock for that young mayoral candidate that you believe in. Give out flyers for the city councilman who's been in office for 15 years but now has some crazy competitor. Offer to table for your county commissioners at the county fair. Get involved in your local political party. Get to know who the players are. Get to know who the people are. Um, tabling and like canvassing for the president is great but they have 100,000 volunteers that are doing that. Your mayor probably only has like three people and one of them's his mom. So like if you're able to get out there and help them, that is going to be way more appreciated. It's also gonna help bring salience to what those local issues are for your community. Um, it, I cannot stress this enough clearly how important this is. So I will get off my soapbox now, but local government, if you wanna get involved is a great place to start. And it's the place where I think you can do the biggest amount of difference with the least amount of time what well, grace I, you're oh go ahead Steph. sorry i was just gonna echo grace and say a township meeting is something unlike anything else so mm -hmm. definitely <laughs> if you want to have your voice heard and hear what's really happening in your local neighborhood and what folks are fired up about that's where you need to be Yep, I've gone to many Harrisburg City Council meetings, and let me tell you, they're better than the Real Housewives. The drama is incredible. Well, that that leads to some of the pre-submitted questions that we've received from alumni ahead of time, and I think really Grace's response uh, leads nicely to the first one, which is from William Lewis, who's a graduate of 1968. Uh, he asked that Democrats traditionally don't take local and state elections or midterms as seriously as Republicans. Do you think 2022 will be different uh, post the Dobbs decision on abortion and freedom of choice than what we've seen in, in prior? Maybe. I, I think change is slow in political parties and strategy changes are slow. Um, I, I think state level, yes. Uh, local level, I think there's still got some catching up to do. Yeah, I echo that. I think that we have the, on on the Republican side, the infrastructure there that we've long had that, um, and we can continue to improve that. Don't get me wrong. There are areas where we, we could use some improvements there, obviously, too. Um, but I don't see that a wide sweeping change on the, in connection to the abortion issue on that alone. I just don't see that. And I think on like the national scale too, looking at polling on that, folks are ranking abortion um, like sixth. I saw a Gallup poll at, on the grand scheme of things with like inflation, the economy, things ranking out one, two, and three. So I think it really does depend. Um, I think it's gonna matter more to Democratic voters and, and their choice of their candidate, but less so with a Republican voter. So. Um, I think like I saw in Pennsylvania alone, I think I saw a poll where it said like 70% of Democrats cared about the abortion stance and, and who they would choose in voting for Fetterman. And it was like 30% respectively towards Oz or something along those lines, those exact numbers. Obviously I'm just sort of estimating off, <laughs> but it was like similarly like that. So I don't think that um, it's going to have that much of an impact. I think it will maybe in some st other states where it's on the ballot initiative there. I think you're really going to see that drive folks to the polls more so than before, but not necessarily in every other state. Okay. Our next question is from William Trousdell, uh, who's a graduate of 1974. Uh, he says, so many campaigns are based on false assessments about the other candidate. How can the electorate filter these lies and half truths? What points can be used to illustrate how false advertising is ruining democracy. So I think I'll just summarize it to say, and, and this is a question I received actually recently uh, in a family uh, weekend lecture I gave on this, which is how, how is it that you can find information you trust? Where can you go and how do you deal with, with essentially lies um, that are disseminated out there in the, the media sphere? Maybe Grace, do you wanna start with this one? 
that's the million dollar question, isn't it? How you can find unbiased information. Um, I, it's really easy to get stuck in your own echo chamber of thought. Um, I'm guilty of it. Everybody's guilty of it. It's way more enjoyable to listen to, to read Twitter when it's things that you agree with rather than when it's not. However, I will say pushing yourself and getting yourself out of that echo chamber is probably one of the most important things you can do. Um, reading some of the more unbiased news sources, I'm thinking like Reuters, I'm not thinking like normal traditional outlets, but where they're more focused on the facts on the paper rather than any sort of political slant is going to be important. However, sourcing out that information is really tough. Um, Reuters is usually a good place to start uh, and then you can kind of go from there. But also um, I think reading thought pieces from different perspectives, like Washington Post posts, they do thought pieces from Republicans, Democrats, independents, academics, whatever. And making sure that you're reading a, a mixed bag of those things is important to challenge your, your own information and help that you don't get stuck in that, that kind of microcosm. Yeah, I, I echo with that too. Um, I think reading those unbiased news sources also understanding and I think acknowledging where, and I, I see this a lot when it's interacting with folks is that they don't know the bias of that piece of information is coming from. They may not know, and it may seem maybe intuitive to some folks, but not to others that, um, you know, the New York Times may have a slant or, ex or you know, <laughs> the article they received from some fringe blog on Facebook is not necessarily, uh, so you need to learn your sources and you need to know the bias where those are coming from first and foremost. So learning those, what you're gonna get, who those commentators are, simple as like Fox News to CNN, some of the basics I think help will help you. Um, and then also, like you said, Grace, getting both sides of an argument. So then you're able to, when you hear a piece of bias information, if it's not from an independent news source, things like that, like AP Reuters, et cetera, C-SPAN, if you're not watching the house floor, um, like some folks, crazy folks like myself do, um, <laughs> if you don't wanna go deep in the weeds to find those information, which you can, it just takes a lot of work that you're, you're able to easily hear that bias and that tilt from those news sources that you're under, like able to recognize that right off the bat, I think it's going to help with that. But hearing both sides of the coin from podcasts, like the round table on Sundays with George Stephanopoulos is a really easily digestible one where they're saying where these folks stand to help learn how to recognize that to podcasts like left, right, and center that will help you um, hear those arguments on all different types of topics from all different sides of the coin. So I do think that that's out there, but just you can source that, go direct to <laughs> unbiased sourcing, you know, C-SPAN, the government puts it out there. It's just a lot to weed through, so. Along those same lines too, if you really, like I think truthfully, the only way to understand a candidate's position is to look at their votes. And if you're, you know, looking at a candidate that hasn't been in office, there's really no way to tell how they're gonna vote. But if you look at somebody who has like, you can look at, I'm just using the first example I thought of, which is Doug, right? Doug's been in the state Senate since 2019. You can look at his voting records since May of 2019. That's a really easy way to figure out where he's at. Now, granted, you have to sift through voting records from 2019, which is about as painful as it gets. So um, that I, I think that's really the only way you can truly obtain that unbiased information about a candidate. The problem runs into candidates that, have, that don't have a voting record. How you're going to get to the bottom of that you can listen to their interviews you can really suss them out but the amount of time i just don't think is realistic for the average person we're nerds so we're going to do it but you know you can always ask your friendly political nerd but um we come at it with our own slant too and our own biases so just something and to keep in mind there are staffers in those office i'll echo that whose job it is if you call and say what is you know, X, Y, and Z, your, your boss's record. I want to know every single vote he's taken in the past. I used to get this all the time. 30 years he's been in Congress on this one particular issue. And then I can do that work for you. Um, may take, you might not get it that same day, but it'll get to you, right? So I think 
that's also a great way tying back into that other question is how do I get involved, right? Creating those relationships, making those touch points, like that's a way you could do it. But then you do run into that issue, as Grace said, of if that person isn't, doesn't have a history, isn't in that office, isn't an incumbent, how do you really suss that out? So you do, you do run into that, but. That, and I think Stephanie would agree with me, this is a sidebar, but if you call your congressman's office, please be nice to the poor person on the phone. Don't be rude. They don't deserve it. They're just here to help you. They can't answer it. They'll find an answer. They'll get back to you. But I think we've both served in the constituent realm before and been yelled at and called terrible things. So if you want your congressman's office to actually help you, just be a decent person. You don't have to have the same political view. We will help people with any political view. That's our job. But be nice about it. Exactly. And I'll also add to that most of the time, the person answering the phone is a poor intern who... <laughs> is just there to survive, just trying to learn. Um, it may not even be of that same party, but just there for like the educational experience. So, you know, be kind if you're feeling frustrated to those poor folks as well. Sometimes they're not even paid, so. <laughs> so we have a question from Joshua Hanneman in 2017, a graduate of 2017, which is what would you say is the single most underrated or overlooked office in most elections in terms of the impact on the voters? Mayor or county commissioner, personally, but either one of those. I would say county commissioner as well. I think that those folks are often overlooked but have the largest impact. Except for Malcolm Dirk, right? Never overlooked, I think. <laughs> Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question, maybe two. So there's some that have come in since we've started. There's one from Jim Hall, which is, isn't the real problem with the two-party system low voter turnout in the primaries? And doesn't the low voter turnout in the prim primaries enable the extreme segments of each party to select the, the nominees for the general election? Low turnout is the problem with every election, not just midterm elections. Um, I think it comes with, I think it comes down to, and this is my personal opinion on this, so feel free to disagree. I think it comes down to the culture of democracy that the United States has, and that we take our elections for granted. Um, I also think that there's a certain amount of privilege that some parts of the population like to show by not voting, that you know they don't vote because it doesn't affect them. And that that's great for you, but it affects a lot of us. Um, so yeah, I mean, turnout is, in general, kind of the root issue always, uh, which is a cop-out answer, but I do think it's a, I think it's the true answer. Um, if more people voted, we would get more participation in the political system, get some diverse voices in there, but it, the culture of democracy in the United States is that you've always been able to vote, so if you skip one election, who cares? Whereas other countries, and this is a bit of an IR angle, they fought for that right. They don't have that culture of democracy. Voting is a fabulous new thing and they're going to go do it at higher rates whereas in the united states i don't think we get above what is it like we don't get above like 60 percent ever uh, we're it depends but we're we're in the high 60s for presidential cool. or we have been recently but yeah that's still lower than other countries yeah i also think that somewhat corresponds with our trust in government being as low as it is these days as well i think you know, it's not just privilege, but my, my vote doesn't count. You hear a lot of that, so why bother? Um, but I do think it, that is a large angle of it. Like, I don't even trust the government to, it, like, it, you're even getting more of that now, like, especially on certain <laughs> rhetoric folks of, you know, I don't even trust these elections, you know, they're, I think you're always going to have some of that, but I think that that whoever asked that question is definitely on brand of sort of what happens in the primaries, right? You get your your diehards who are coming out for those primary elections every single year. Um, they tend to be, you know, on my side, the most red meat folks who are always coming out. That's how you get like the Doug Mastrianos of us all out of a primary, right? Um, so I do think that that is accurate there. They are the, usually the most engaged because they're the most fired up. They've typically had the most interaction. They're really following those issues. So I do think it is voters being informed, the distrust of government, 
sort of that whole subsect of, of area there that their vote doesn't count. So. Mm -hmm. I, was, I will say too, I think for the primaries and the candidates are coming out of it, low turnout is one thing, but it's also, if you have a primary that's fueling many different candidates, that can split different segments of the vote, right? So um, if you've got five candidates that are more centrist, they're going to split the centrist vote. Um, and that, that also can yield an effect like that as well. Yeah, we saw that with the governor's primary on the Republican side. Like there was a last ditch effort to kind of coalesce around. It wasn't even really super coordinated, but there was like a an effort two days before the primary after a lot of people had already voted by mail to kind of coalesce around Lou Barletta, who was the other kind of emerging leader behind Doug Mastriano, um, where the rest of the they were up to like 20 candidates at one point in the primary. Um, yeah, it was a lot um, to have some of them drop out in hopes that those votes would go to lose so that then he would overtake Doug. Um, problem is it just happened too last minute for it to really be effective. People were confused. Nobody knew what was going on. Corman was in the race and he was out of the race and he was back in the race. So yeah, that's a, that's a strategy that they need to take into account and, and um, primaries it matters because it can be the difference with like two or three votes at this point because so few people are voting. And this is sort of a little off topic, Dr. Clark, but I wonder, this is just, I'm curious, I don't even know if this has been studied or someone has looked at this. Like, I think a large issue that you see that specifically in Pennsylvania that happened is the changes in like the part, the, the state parties used to have a lot more power and weight behind them, being able to throw that in there and sort of cut some of these folks, have force a little, you know, force them out, so to speak. And now that they're not holding as much weight and power to sort of create that mechanism, what is the impact on that look like? I, in Pennsylvania, we see that, but I've seen it in other states. Um, so wondering to see how those state party offices and their dwindling power and presence in the field and how that's going to impact these primaries moving forward. I don't know if that's been studied, but if it is, I would love to read. <laughs> there is older research that says that affirms what you're saying, that the power base and central parties can help to filter candidates. I don't know if there's been anything more recent that's looked at the sort of reverse of that, right? Um, there, they may, there may well be in the state politics literature, but that if as the party organizations weaken, that's allowing um, maybe less competitive candidates to make it through. Um, that and they definitely. only hurt themselves, right? Like crowded right. primaries are not good for anybody because you spend a lot of your money and your time fighting each other. And that money and that time could be fighting your like general election <laughs> opponent. Yeah. But also then you have to deal with more attacks. Like your own Republican buddy called you this thing so now you have to deal with it that's what Oz is kind of running into right correct spending, yeah so much of his time trying to overcome the attacks that McCormick left him that he didn't have enough time to jump on Fetterman and now that he's finally catching his train is it enough that he's going to make it across the finish line precisely and then you're left with sort of what do these other candidates do now do they throw their support behind someone they just spent months and months bashing does that now look disingenuine will those voters who were such staunch supporters of that other primary candidate who lost will they follow suit and back that they might not you know they might stick to their guns and not even come out and vote any, anymore so you do face all of that but i think it is really interesting in pennsylvania in particular um knowing that like the pa gop and that crowded primary made the executive choice the chairman said like we are not going to endorse a single candidate we're not going to weigh in like that was a choice that they made but had they of we could have been in a very different situation right so looking forward to that i just find that very fascinating and maybe the literature will <laughs> catch up to this emerging area i'd love to see the impacts of that across like state by state basis but definitely can see the lasting impact impacts of that one in this cycle so corollary of it in the in congress too because there's a, a pretty broad literature that says that that's how leaders in congress like say mcconnell would would traditionally exert power by because they 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 decided committee assignments and committee chairs and for elected representatives to get onto a higher profile committee or a committee that's relevant to their constituents 
or to even chair it, that gave you greater media attention, greater oxygen, more money. And so it was necessary. And so you didn't cross your leader, right? Because you didn't, you didn't want to be shut out of power by doing so. But now we're in an environment where you can pretty much get media attention and raise money by crossing the leader, right? Um, if anything, I think being banned from committees might have helped Marjorie Taylor Greene in terms of her, her you know, overall profile and fundraising ability. So I, I think you've seen a weakening of the leadership at that level as well. Yeah, I think those are like edge cases in my opinion. I Hopefully that doesn't necessarily continue, I would hope for the sake of our government's effectiveness. But I will say like when it comes down to nitty gritty, like steering committee to get those folks onto those committees still holds a lot of weight. It's just not often talked about in the media that people don't quite realize, but those folks who are on the steering committee making those committee choices of who's gonna have those leadership positions, that is still um, holds a lot of respect and a lot of clout. Like you don't wanna cross those individuals. So that's still definitely at play. Um, but I hope like <laughs> those edge cases don't become the norm because um, that'd be very dysfunctional even more so. It's also annoying for the opposing side, right? Like Marjorie Taylor Greene, fundraising powerhouse. She can bring a ton of money into the Republican Party. Um, we saw that last cycle was South Carolina, right? Jamie Harrison did not have a shot of beating Lindsey Graham, but that was the most expensive Senate race we've ever seen. So it forces the parties to spend money on unwinnable seats, which you could use as a strategy. But ultimately, you're hurting yourself. You're shooting yourself in the foot. So those kinds of like outrage politics don't play well, no matter what side of the aisle you fall on. Well, this has been fun. I don't know if the people listening to us have had as much fun, but I have. Um, I do have a wrap up I need to read. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, the next session organized by our advancement office is on Tuesday, November 8th at 7 p.m. when Wuzi Chipula joins us from the Majuju Cafe in Zambia. Uh, sh she'll show us how to prepare a popular dish from the cafe and talk about food culture compared to America. And then we have other upcoming alumni events, including the Vesper Boat Club gathering in Philadelphia on October 20th, uh, the Homecoming Reunion Week in October 28th and 29th, and the Thirsty Moose Happy Horse in Portsmouth, New Hampshire on November 5th. Uh, I'm going to plug to homecoming weekend, the Department of Political Science is bringing back Dr. Barish Kesgen, uh, who many of you may have to give a lecture the Thursday before homecoming weekend. So anybody that's an SU alum and that's around, we'd be happy to see you then or Saturday at the reception. Uh, but for more information about these and other events, go to www.sualum.com. Uh, and again, thank us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Grace and to Stephanie. Uh, and I hope everyone has a good evening.